uh, we have an ASA 2 in orbit and we are working on an ASA 5. Um, we will go to the ministers, to the European ministers responsible uh, for ESA uh, next year in autumn to ask them to continue this program. So we have five year financing slices and I am sure that the convincing results of the first Earth Explorer mission will also um, be a good reason uh, to continue this very, very successful European program uh, to explore our planet Earth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Liebig. Then we move to Professor Pai. Mm -hmm. Should I do it from here? No, you can. Okay. Yeah, you can hold it up. Yeah. to show you uh, the results which we have achieved uh, from this mission. Uh, but first, I would like to give you a very brief overview of what this rotating sphere or rotating potato, I don't like this word, but uh, anyway, uh, what is this? What is this geoid? And um, it has a lot to do with heights. And the reason for this one is maybe very simple. I just show you something. You have here a water level. And this water level is, uh, or on this water level, is acting the gravity field. Which means um, with this water level, you can really define what is up and down, uh, what is vertical, and what is horizontal. And uh, this is the <coughs> key reason why, with gravity field, we um, define heights and we define globally horizontal, we define globally uh, level, which means what is equal height, what is the direction of the water flow. And now this geoid is nothing else than, uh, let's call it an ideal ocean, if there were no uh, other forces, um, pressure differences due to salinity, for example, or um, um, other things like wind stress, for example. And uh, what you see here is, in principle, then, uh, the shape of such an ideal ocean also continued below the continents. And just to give you an, an example on the amplitudes you have here, or the, what we are talking about, um, consider that our Earth were a simple sphere, a homogeneous sphere, then we would have a very, very boring gravity field on the surface because it would be a constant. It would be somewhere 9.8 something, but nothing else. Um, if we now consider that our Earth is rotating, uh, we get a flattening of the Earth, which is in the order of approximately 20 kilometer in radius. And uh, then you get deviations of this well-known 9.8 something in the second digit, which means from 9.78 to 9.83 approximately. Um, still a quite boring gravity field. What we see else, and now the interesting thing starts, we see, of course, uh, topography, mountains, additional masses. So if you would cut off Himalaya, for example, you would uh, uh, get uh, a change in the gravity field in the third digit. Um, if you have irregular mass distributions in the interior of the Earth, and we come to this a little bit later, then you will change this value in the, fifth, uh, in the fourth digit, and so on and so forth. So what we are showing you here is, in principle, the gravity field um, reduced by the effect of the sphere and reduced by the, uh, by the Earth's flattening. And uh, the left uh, picture over there is simply the remaining deviations due to uh, inhomogeneous mass distributions on the Earth, but also in the Earth's interior. So the big gain is not really to uh, plot this uh, picture on the upper left here, 
but uh, to get it with a very, very high accuracy, which is also related to the 10 to the power minus 12 we have seen here um, uh, concerning the measurement accuracy. So we want to uh, uh, compute or have this very, very precisely, which means you want to have it down to the at least fifth digit with a spatial resolution of 100 kilometers. So the deviations you see on the, on the top left is in the order of one plus minus 100 meters and we want to define or measure this surface with an accuracy of in the centimeter level. Why is this important or why do we have these deviations? One of the reasons is that we have inhomogeneous mass distributions in the interior of the Earth due to thermal processes, due to the fact that there is uh, denser and less dense material. And if I, uh, I would like to point your attention maybe uh, on this, we don't see it, okay, uh, on, on uh, India, you can see it uh, quite centered on the left plot, where you have your big minimum. And on the right hand side, you see a model of the internal of the Earth, a dynamic model, where you also see some anomalies, some, uh, in this case, temperature anomalies, which can be translated in a quite um, sophisticated procedure, also in density anomalies. So you can already see there are some relations between uh, the gravity field and the surface and the mass and mass distribution in the interior of the Earth. So now a few things about the solution, only one line, just to show you that this is really a huge thing which we are processing here. Uh, we are uh, observing per second four, five observations in this over a very, very long time period. And what uh, the solution in, uh, in principle is, is nothing else than a huge equation system, you know, maybe from, from school. Uh, an equation system with uh, <coughs> yeah, three equations for the solution for three parameters. What we have here, we have meanwhile gathered in the order of 70 million observations to estimate a model of the gravity field in the order of 60 to 70 thousand parameters. So really a very huge system. And uh, the gain with respect to what we had uh, in the formal solutions uh, is that we now have a more solid database. We will show you today a solution based on uh, seven uh, months of data, which also means that we get a higher accuracy, uh, but also a higher spatial resolution down to 100 kilometer, so that we can really claim that this is the best gravity field data we have ever got from space. Just to show it to you, now in terms of this very, very small quantities in terms of these measurement accuracies. This is now not uh, this 100 meters, or, uh, uh, but in, in, in a very, very uh, small dimension. Uh, deviations of the newly obtained gravity field from the best model we had so far. And you might maybe already see some key differences, for example, in South America and in Africa. Uh, Himalaya, but also Antarctica. Uh, you can see also some uh, not very smooth pattern over the ocean, but over, uh, also over areas where we have very good gravity field information from terrestrial measurements such as Europe. And if you compare it now with the new solution, you will see immediately what we have gained only by taking three times the same, uh, three times uh, uh, of the data volume. Uh, what remains, and this is uh, particularly interesting, is that in these regions where we don't have very good gravity field data, uh, such as South America, Antarctica, and so on, uh, we get um, really uh, very uh, big differences that we really get uh, already with this uh, seven months model, really new gravity field information which we not, never got beforehand. And these are regions where you have also very interesting geophysical applications, for example, sub, uh, subduction zone, uh, South America, uh, in, in Africa, in Antarctica, where we have a lot of geophysics hidden below a very thick 
uh, sheet of ice, and with this mission we can look below this ice sheet and also can see features from this one. Uh, this is maybe a little bit of scientific plot, uh, but I still would like to show it to you. Um, what is our goal? Is is a spatial wavelength globally of 100 kilometer. And what is maybe also important to mention is that we get really uh, these accuracies globally with the same accuracy, which means independently whether we are in Central Europe or we, uh, whether we are in Central Africa, we get really the same um, accuracy of, this, of these models. The red one is the one, uh, the, the very first one, based on two months of data. The new one uh, uh, is the blue one. And uh, our mission goal uh, is here at the one milligal level. I don't explain it to you, but this is uh, one of the two mission goals which we would like to achieve. And you will see now that we are in the order of, let's say, 1.8. Uh, still above this goal, but uh, with uh, by the end of the mission, uh, uh, to the end of 2012, we will uh, quite sure that we will achieve it. We can see really that only by taking more data we will get a dramatically better accuracy, and this is shown here as well. Maybe a few applications, only a few words on this one. Uh, Rory Bingham will show you a lot more afterwards. I already mentioned that uh, based on this gravity field, we have really the chance to look into the Earth. Uh, and this is especially important for uh, the crust or for the upper uh, few uh, kilometers, where a lot of processes which are driven by these uh, thermal processes in the interior occur, which are leading to volcanism, which are leading to earthquakes. And by means of this, um, Gravity field models, uh, we have the, uh, um, a means to also look into this Earth and get an idea on the processes which are occurring there. Um, just to show it also uh, for such a, what we call a subduction zone, two plates which uh, go beyond each other. And you see it very nicely uh, on, on top, the correlation with the gravity field. Uh, on the right hand side, you see it for a region which was uh, in, in, in the papers during the last few weeks in uh, Japan, where you can also see this uh, typical geo uh, or um, a gravity structure which is related to this subduction zone and, uh, and the gravity field or a better knowledge of the gravity field will help us there already to get a better understanding what happens there. A second big issue on the last one I would like to show you are height systems. I already mentioned beforehand that uh, the GO8, what we, what we are deriving here, is a, a perfect surface for, uh, for heights or for the definition of heights. And we have now the situation that we have worldwide the order of 200 different height systems. Uh, and by means of having such a consistent, globally consistent reference surface, uh, it will be a big step towards a unification of this height system. This is, for example, uh, important <coughs> if, uh, if you consider the, the example of the, um, of the uh, construction of the tunnel between uh, France and Great Britain, where it turned out that we have half a meter difference, which was not known beforehand, simply due to the fact that uh, they are, uh, they, these two height systems were linked to different reference surfaces. And now we have really the means to uh, make such a consistent model uh, all over the world. And this is, I think, also for um, engineering a very important thing. I will not go into um, oceanography because this is the field by Rory Bingham and he can much better explain it to you than myself. Okay, thanks. Good. Okay, so I'm one of those rare people that has um, an oceanographer that has some understanding of geodesy. 
So perhaps that's why I was selected. Um, thanks for the invitation to, and hopefully I can do some justice to this uh, amazing um, mission. Because it's okay, so the first thing uh, this goes to his name, Gravity and Steady State Ocean Circulation Explorer. And I've highlighted there in red the bit that I'm interested in. And you might ask, well, what's steady state? Well, with all this talk of climate change and our experience of daily weather, we tend to forget that really most of the um, forcing that drives the ocean is pretty steady, pretty constant. And over thousands of years that that forcing has been uh, acting on the ocean, the ocean has come into a steady state, an equilibrium with its forces. And um, this is the thing that we want to try and understand, because to understand that is a prerequisite for then going on to ask the question, well, if we change that forcing by a certain threshold, can it change the steady state circulation into another, maybe more um, difficult steady state? So that leads to another question, why is GOES relevant to the stud study of the oceans and to the climate? Well, as Roland mentioned, if the ocean were at rest, its surface would coincide with the geoid um, by definition. But the ocean isn't at rest, there are these um, forces um, acting on it continually which give rise to a circulation, which means that actually there's a small deviation from the geodetic or rest position. For quite a, um, a number of years now, actually, we've been able to measure the sea surface with quite good accuracy using satellite altimetry. And um, this is a map of the sea surface you get from satellite altimetry. And actually, it's not, the sea surface isn't smooth, and I think this is quite a surprise to a lot of people. The sea surface is actually lumpy and bumpy, and it looks like the topography. So, for instance, in the North Atlantic, you can see the Mid-Atlantic Ridge re reflected in the sea surface. Now, if I could freeze the sea surface, and put a marble on it, then it wouldn't roll because the geoid, by definition, defines a level surface, and that's why it's interesting to us as oceanographers. But the problem is that the steady state circulation is a very, very small component of the surface height variations that are due to the geoid, um, of the order of about 1%. And as, Rune, um, as um, Ryan mentioned earlier, that is an ill conditioned problem. So, <coughs> If we subtract the geoid from the mean sea surface from altimetry, we end up with what's known as the ocean's mean dynamic topography, which is a reflection of the steady state circulation of the ocean. And this is what GOES has delivered. This is the, 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 the real interesting result from an oceanographic point of view. And it's quite remarkable that we can resolve features of the ocean's circulation in such good detail with only eight months of data. So this MDT is a reflection of the, um, as I said, the ocean's steady state circulation. Um, the ocean, if the, the ocean's circulation, and it has this structure, most people don't realize that the ocean has this quite complicated structure. All of this structure um, really comes down to the fact that the ocean, that, sorry, the Earth rotates. If the Earth didn't rotate, the oceans would be quite a boring place and would have quite different characteristics. So um, Marina asked me to try and describe geography, and that is, how can you go from having height to learning anything about ocean currents. And it comes down to this principle of geostrophy. And I'm sorry, I'll do a little bit of science for a second here. Geostrophy basically means to turn with the Earth. So <clears throat> this is the cross section through the ocean. And you can see um, the geoid represented by the black dashed line there. That's the level line, if you like. And the mean sea surface departs from that. And the difference gives us our mean dynamic topography. OK, so water is higher on one side than the other and that creates a pressure gradient force from high to low. Under normal circumstances, if the Earth wasn't rotating, or in um, smaller scale um, fluid dynamics, what happens is that the pressure gradient force forces the water to equal, equalize with the level surface. So water flows from high pressure to low pressure, like it does, for instance, in the hose pipe. Now, the, the ocean is very interesting because Basically, the dominant balance in the ocean is between the horizontal pressure gradient and another force called the Coriolis force. Um, someone um, talked today about how gravity doesn't really exist. Well, actually, the Coriolis force doesn't really exist. It's an apparent force that um, appears because we are, live on a rotating reference frame, which is basically the Earth. So what happens is that initially, the fluid wants to move, and this is shown down here in the, uh, in the plan view in the bottom right. What actually happens is the water wants to move with the pressure gradient. As it moves, the Coriolis force acts to its, to its right, perpendicularly to its right, in the northern hemisphere, and in the, um, to its left in the, in the southern hemisphere. That causes the fluid to rotate round, and eventually it reaches a steady state where the horizontal pressure gradient is balanced by the Coriolis force. 
and water moves basically along pressure gradient contours, and that's the state that the ocean exists in. So if we know the pressure gradient or height field, we can determine the ocean currents. And this is what, as oceanographers, we're really interested in learning about the ocean currents. One of the problems is that taking a gradient of a field, as you need to do to work out the currents, also amplifies noise. That's why it's very important that the geoid is as good as possible and has as low noise as possible. So this is the ocean currents without any filtering from the second ghost model. And I think this is quite remarkable that without any filtering at all, you can see lots of um, important circulation features emerging here. For instance, in the North Atlantic, you can see very clearly the, the Gulf Stream and some of its extension. You can work out some of the boundary currents around Greenland. You can see, for instance, in the North Pacific, an equivalent, which is called the Kuroshio Current. Um, down on the southern tip of Africa, you can see what's known as the Agulhas Retroflexion. And then, going throughout the Southern Ocean, there's what's known as the ACC. So all those features are beginning to emerge. They become even clearer if I apply a little bit of smoothing. And now you can really see the details of, uh, of the field, of the ocean's global circulation um, being resolved quite clearly. And I should stress that this comes about just from purely satellite measurement. So you have two satellites of completely different types orbiting the Earth, sensing one sensing the time that it takes the electromagnetic radiation to bounce off the surface, the other one's measuring tiny variations in the strength of the Earth's gravitational field. And we can combine those and produce an estimation of the ocean circulation. And I think that's quite uh, remarkable. <coughs> the other, um, prior to um, GOES being launched, the best estimate we had of the global gravity field came, sat satellite estimate, came from GRACE. And as uh, Ryan said, it's not fair to really to compare the two satellites. But over on the left-hand panel shows the estimate of the currents from, Grace MD, from a GRACE mean dynamic topography based on eight years of observations. And you can contrast that with GOES um, mean dynamic topography currents based on eight months of observations. So you can see that um, this really highlights just what a remarkable mission GOES is. Okay, now I'd like to focus in on a few um, particular regions of the ocean. Because people might say, okay, we know what the ocean circulates, why do we care about that? And often that's the response I get from my non-oceanographic friends, and often have to convince my wife quite often that I'm not wasting my time in the job that I do. <laughs> so, one of the particularly important areas is the North Atlantic, and um, th this is a region which really plays a key role in um, controlling or regulating Earth's climate, because it carries a lot of heat from the equator and redistributes it towards the pol polar regions and higher latitudes in, in the Gulf Stream. And, 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 and by doing so, it helps maintain a relatively mild climate of um, northern, northwestern Europe. <coughs> when the water arrives in the Labrador Sea, which is um, basically the, um, the part which is to the south of um, Greenland, it, it sinks, it gets really, really cold, really salty, it sinks, and it creates what's called an overturning circulation. And that's believed to play a very key role in the redistribution of heat within the ocean. And, 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 and then on, because of that, it has a role in um, controlling the Earth's climate. It's also an interesting region because you have um, a number of different types of oceanographic feature in this region. You have the very strong Gulf Stream, where um, the core speeds are up to two meters per second, and um, the water traveling is maybe 30, um, 30 million cubic meters per second, which is equivalent to 150 Amazon rivers. So it's, it's a vast amount of water that's being transported there. And from my initial calculations, with GOES, we were able to estimate that with a 50% greater accuracy than we have been able to do previously. And, and, and <coughs> largely has big implications for our understanding of um, heat transport and, um, and how that in turn impacts on climate. Another interesting feature, which uh, Jonathan Hall um, um, heard me mention before, is the, um, a, a, it's called the Man Eddy, just where the Gulf Stream ends. There's a persistent rotation in that region, um, and GOES has been able to resolve sm even small features like that now. <coughs> I have a couple more examples. The next one is the Agulhas Current. So this is a very interesting, from a, a dynamic point of view, and what happens is that you have a, shown here on the left is the mean dynamic topography for the Gulls region, and on the right is the current speeds estimated from um, GOES. So what happens is you have an, um, the Gulls current, which travels south along the um, eastern coast of Africa, and as it rounds the tip of um, 
Africa and the Cape of Africa, it interacts with the eastward flown, very strong ACC, Arctic Circum Polar Current, and that causes it to bend back on itself or retroflect. And that, that tip is resolved very, very clearly now with the, with the um, ghost data. Uh, every so often, at regular intervals, the tip, the tip pinches off and um, it, it jet, injects warm water, relatively warm water, into the Atlantic, and that helps feed this process of overturning. And these eddies are called um, Agulhas rings. Another role that the ocean has is in the dispersant of pollutants. Um, it's, um, things get lost into the ocean and infected on ocean currents. <coughs> this picture here is of the, um, the circulation of the NPT on the left-hand side of the North Pacific. And on the right is the currents. This is basically an analogue of the um, Gulf Stream in the Atlantic. It's called the Kuroshio Current. So it travels um, quite tightly against the Asian um, continental shelf up to about 35 degrees north, where it's, um, it's deflected into the, into the Pacific as the, what's known as the um, Kuroshio Extension. And again, we're being able to resolve this now purely with space-based methods, better than we've ever been able to do before. This is something that goes with delivered. And um, I hesitate to mention this because I don't want to seem sensationalist, but uh, um, it just so happens that the Fukushima nuclear power plant lies within um, 200 kilometers of the core of the Croatia extension. So I think there's lots of confounding factors in this, and I can't say exactly how the, um, the, the Croatia extension would impact on um, any dispersant of pollu pollutants, should there be a, um, a sort of a major injection of pollution into the radioactive contamination into the ocean. But uh, it certainly could be said that having accurate knowledge of the currents in that region would be very useful in being able to tr um, track any dispersant of pollutants. So just a um, final summary and outlook. We've seen that the first gravity model, which was based on just two months of data, really um, revolutionized our view of the ocean um, from space-based space methods. Um, the second release has refined this further, and now we can really identify the major currents of the ocean, the speeds and the paths more accurately, and also we can begin to resolve some of the finer scale features, like the Man Eddy and the, um, and the Gulas retroflection, which tell us things about the dynamics of the ocean. There's many applications, I think, to having this accurate knowledge of the ocean. Uh, for instance, in understanding, as I said, um, we need to understand the mean state of the ocean before we can go on to try and work out how it might respond to um, perturbations in the climate and, and also impact back onto climate itself. Um, in trying to understand many um, features of the, of the ocean, um, interesting physics of the ocean. One of the, one of the things about the ocean is it's so vast, it's so hard to go out and actually measure directly. So any satellite system which helps us look at it more closely is a very positive thing for oceanography. Also, the ability to track pollutants, I think that's going to be an important practical application of um, having a better understanding of the ocean currents. Um, for the future, we can look forward to, as um, the GOES mission continues and we begin to refine further the geoid, we can see a, a similar refinement of our ability to estimate the NDT and ocean currents. Um, also, I think at the moment, this is really just using quite basic processing techniques. Um, one of the features of the GOES mission is that it's going to deliver uh, a sort of uh, the error covariance, which characterise how the, um, the properties of the errors of the GOES geoid. And hopefully we can use those in oceanography to extract more information from the, from the, ghost, um, the ghost geoid or gravity field. And also, finally, work has begun now to take the MDT, which is um, generate geodetic MDT, which has been um, calculated, and assimilate it into ocean or climate models to help constrain those models. And I think we can look forward to some really exciting developments in the future. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh a gravity mission is not the easiest mission to explain, but in the room today we have some of the best space and science journalists in, uh, in Europe. So we'll now turn over to your questions. We'll have a walking microphone with my colleague here, Andreas. And when you post a question, please state your name and the media you're from, please. Any questions? Just uh, 
Reiner, you said earlier today that uh, by the end of 2012, which is what you've got a budget for, you're a happy guy. So what happens after 2012? Is there a decision now on whether to continue it? I know Absolutely. from what Runa said, that there's fuel for at least two, maybe up to five years. So what happens at the end of 2012, or will they have to await another ESA council decision? Uh, I listened very carefully to the opening remarks of the director, and uh, he projected already beyond 2012. And of course, we hope that we can have this mission till it, its end, its uh, natural end, because each <laughs> measurement cycle will exactly help to refine, to see this ocean uh, features, but also solid uh, physics features. So of course, uh, I mean, at the moment we were glad to have the extension till the end of 2012. But when uh, the end of 2012 gets closer, we will start to push for an extension again. Kuren Chimaya from Nature. Um, a, a question probably to, to Rory. Um, of this, well, I understand this is now the, well, the, the results of the two measurement cycles, right? Um, can you say anything about whether there, well, with, with the data you have so far, is there anything particular um, surprising or unexpected in, in how, well, uh, in, in how ocean circulation functions or in, in, in relative strengths of, of specific at the moment, I've been at the moment, yes. yes. Is the microphone working? Yes. I mean, at the moment, it is early days, and I have been um, focusing on some of the more um, the, the major features that we know about. Because if we see something novel, then how do we know that it's correct? We need to start to validate what we're seeing against the the um, well-known features of the ocean circulation. It's just that we are able to measure those more accurately than we ever have done before, and. Um, determine the paths and locations. I have seen some small features in, in, the, um, in the circulation of the North Atlantic, for instance, uh, um, that uh, didn't appear in some of the other types of observations of the Atlantic um, to do with the North Atlantic current. But uh, at the moment, we're still looking at uh, mainly um, understanding and validating the major features that we can resolve. Gigi Donelli, Radio 24, Sole 24 Ore Milano. Uh, what my question is, let's say, taking back to the basics, and I would like to ask, uh, why should the general public be interested in having a detailed gravity deviation map, which is absolutely fantastic to, even when I don't understand, I think it's fantastic for the capacity to mix, to launch, uh, and to obtain that. But in order to <coughs> give an explication, which in hopefully will reach also the politician when they have to decide uh, for the financing. So in what case this may concern the people's life? Maybe I try. <laughs> it's a bit overarching. I, I mean, we have seen in the morning many examples. Uh, the one which is maybe closest uh, to everybody's life is uh, that in the next generation of GPS receivers, in each you will find this model based on the Gochi data, uh, so that the terrestrial altitudes um, are more accurate than they are at the moment. Um, the other things are more indirect. Uh, it has been mentioned that when the, uh, the tunnel was built under, under the channel, uh, there was a mismatch of 50 centimeters uh, when they drilled, uh, because they had different reference systems. Uh, and this drilling is, is always controlled by laser measurements, which are extremely accurate, but of course they don't correct the reference systems. Uh, so this is maybe a, a smaller part of the public, but these are two examples where it is of real re relevance, and there are many others more than in the scientific side. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, Peter Farmer from the Dutch newspaper, the Volkskrant <coughs> in Amsterdam. I have a question for Mr. Uh, Rimmel. Uh, from the workshop, I, I understand and I gather that you are still 
finding out how to interpret uh, the data from Gochi and to validate it. When will that? When will this work be finished? After this workshop, or will, will you need many more uh, meetings to uh, uh, find out precisely what you can do with with the data from Gochi? Uh, I guess the answer is uh, whenever you have a really complicated system, uh, compare it um, in astronomy uh, to the space telescope, and then you are never really at the end. I mean, these are this is fine tuning. So you you have your uh, Mercedes or Ferrari, but now we are doing the fine tuning, and I expect that. Uh, even beyond the end of the mission, we will try to, uh, to take out certain effects from the data which we observe and which we probably don't like. For example, the accelerometers are really fantastic new instruments on short scales, but on long scales they are not that good. And we knew that before, but of course they are affected by many physical processes which we step by step also try to understand and, and more or less uh, remove their effect. Very good. More questions? Yes. Christian Dubrul from uh, Le Soir in Brussels. Um, these kind of measurements, although you can expect a uh, a longer mission than initially planned, that will remain, these measurements will remain one-shot measurements, or wouldn't it be sensible to have a repetition of that kind of measurements um, every 10 years or 20 years? And in, if yes, what kind of information will that bring to you, scientists, regarding the interior of the herd and the evolution of whatever is in there? Thank you. Yeah, maybe I can answer this. What we can see now is that uh, we get, uh, with every new measurement, of course, new information. Uh, we uh, have uh, even almost the ideal situation currently that uh, um, that the improvement of the gravity field information we get now is really, uh, according to the, e uh, the ideal case, you can really get, which means this um, square root of observation rule um, which means that we are decreasing with any new measurement this uh, this uh, accuracy, and uh, this means that we uh, can both improve the accuracy, but uh, in the same way we can also, uh, to some extent, uh, improve the spatial resolution, and uh, especially the spatial resolution improvement. Uh, below the 100 kilometers, of course, uh, of uh, additional radio uh, for this type uh, of investigations. Yeah. On time variation. Uh, okay. Yeah, I guess you also were addressing the time variation. Okay. Uh, time variation in Goche is certainly a little bit of a difficult uh, thing simply due to the fact that uh, we are uh, going for static gravity field and really high resolution. Uh, this Goche mission is not uh, designed to, um, to measure the uh, long wavelength features with the same accuracy as we have it, for example, for GRACE, and therefore we will certainly not be able to compete with uh, GRACE in this respect. But of course we will also, and we are currently also already investigating whether Gochi can help to support uh, in also in this, in this effect uh, the um, results which we uh, have achieved by GRACE, for example. Okay, I think uh, we can have at least uh, two more questions before we move to individual interviews. Uh, there was a gentleman here, you have not spoken? Thank you. Peter Schmidt from München and Aikura. Did the uh, earthquake in Japan uh, have influences on the shape of that guillot? Um Yes, of course it should, because there was a mass movement. 
we uh, do not yet see it because um, it was a maybe lucky situation that the satellite flew over this this region uh, with the ground track uh, one day after uh, exactly the earthquake but this one uh, track is not um, sufficient to really see in this raw data already the, the effect but we should really see something of this kind if we have, uh, as we always have it, uh, for a longer time period and then we can compare beforehand and afterwards. Uh, Peter van Rooij from Dutch newspaper, the Volkskrant. Uh, astronomers are always pleading for bigger telescopes for uh, more satellites. Is it also with, uh, with geophysicists? Uh, are they already looking for another satellite uh, to put in the space and to uh, get even more uh, accurate measurements? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was yesterday a meeting. Right. <laughs> with, uh, of course, we, we uh, continue to dream. Uh, mm -hmm. There was yesterday a meeting with uh, ESA and NASA officials about uh, whether Second one today. could envisage a joint mission NASA ESA uh, for a follow-on. But then we talk about, let's say, 2025. Very good. Then I think we will close the web transmission and we'll move over to the individual interviews part. Thank you. How about the level? How about the level?